This video is brought to you by MUBI, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Try MUBI free for 30 days at MUBI.com slash CinemaTyler. Full Metal Jacket was Vincent D'Onofrio's first movie, and it not only opened the door to a great career in film, but it also taught him a lot about acting for the screen. He credits Kubrick's direction for the way he's acted on film throughout his career. Because this was his first movie, D'Onofrio reached out to his acting coach, Sharon Chatton, several times during the production. He would do this thing, I'm assuming she taught him, where he would recite the three blind mice nursery rhyme in his head while doing dialogue scenes as Pyle. He described it as a dark, monotone version playing in his head constantly. Kubrick entrusted his actors to make the performance work, and would usually have them come up with how to play each scene. He was against any kind of showing off, usually saying, just do it right. It's all you have to do. Don't showboat. Just fucking do it. Kubrick was also against any unnecessary camera moves, which he found pretentious, opting instead to move the camera only to help tell the story. Did he help you construct the character? Did he? No. Like, no. He no wants doesn't, you, doesn't talk about story, doesn't talk about character, doesn't talk about anything. Just tells you to stand over there? No, he just says, what are you going to do? Oh, really? Yeah. And then you do it, and then you do it again, and he said, you guys have to do it faster than that. Or better than that. And it's like, um, can you think of anything more interesting than that to do? He'll say things like yeah. that. And uh, so Matthew and I would go away and we'd come back with a scene and he'd go, okay, I'm going to put a camera here, put a camera here. Instead of going over there, walk over there because that's where the light's going to come from and we'll shoot. Eventually, slowly with the scenes that we started out with, he started to get an idea of what I was doing and he never complained about it. Right? Mm, mm, I mean, yeah, he just let me great. keep going. So I said, okay, I'm not getting fired yet. This is awesome. But as Private Pile makes his transformation into a killer, a rift between acting styles would add an extra element to some of Pyle's most pivotal scenes. The monster in him would have to come out, and that's where D'Onofrio would turn to some early cinema classics for inspiration. This is the story of how monster movies and an onset feud shaped Private Pile's madness. Vincent D'Onofrio and Matthew Modine both got their start in theater, but the two studied opposing acting styles. D'Onofrio studied the Lee Strasberg method, and Modine, who played Joker in the film, studied the Stella Adler method. The difference in the Strasberg method and the Adler method boils down to where an actor's emotion is coming from. Strasberg felt that an actor should draw on their own experiences, and Adler felt that an actor should draw on their imagination surrounding the given circumstances of a scene. In his Full Metal Jacket diary, Matthew Modine talks about visiting D'Onofrio's acting class based on Strasberg and finding it much different than his class based on Adler. With Strasberg, actors tend to stay in character when the scene is over. <laughs> and with Adler, actors let it go and return to their normal selves when finishing a take. <laughs> Modine says that Strasberg and Adler are thought to be absolute enemies. Despite being good friends, a tension began to grow between Modine and D'Onofrio. Shortly after D'Onofrio's knee injury, Modine was joking around with extras in between camera rehearsals. When the sun was finally in the right spot, Kubrick told Modine to stop joking around and to tense up because he was ready to shoot, and the goofing off really seemed to frustrate D'Onofrio. Well, they call me the Joker. <laughs> He confronted Modine about joking around all the time and threatened to kick his ass. Well, I got a joke for you. I'm gonna tear you a new asshole. No! All of the extras thought that a fight might break out. Modine contemplated hitting him with his rifle, but decided not to, because they would have to stop shooting if one of them got injured. They stopped talking to each other. They even used Stanley's daughter Vivian as an intermediary. Marge, tell Bart I just want to drink a nice glass of syrup like I do every morning. Tell him yourself you're ignoring Lisa, not Bart. Then it was time to film the montage of Joker helping Pyle learn how to be a soldier. Throughout this entire montage, Modine and D'Onofrio hated each other's guts. And because of how Kubrick worked, he had Modine and D'Onofrio come up with what they would do in many of these segments. Kubrick wanted some ideas for things that Joker could help Pyle with. During their training with Lee Ermey, they had been taking apart M16s and putting them back together, so they did that. They also improvised the part where Joker helps Pyle over the obstacle. Kubrick sat on a camera crane and they would just riff until Kubrick said, yeah, do that. To prepare for these segments, Modine read Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men, about two ranch workers, one who is big and strong but mentally disabled, and another who takes care of him. 
What's interesting is that Kier DeLay said that he was thinking about Of Mice and Men when he performed the scene of disconnecting HAL 9000 in 2001 A Space Odyssey. Kubrick came up with the bedsheet folding and typed up a few lines. He also came up with the rifle spinning bit, but that was all improvised. Everybody hates me now. Even you. For this part, D'Onofrio and Modine improvised the lines while rehearsing, and then Kubrick typed it up and they shot it as written. During this time, Modine wrote in his diary that he wondered if the rift between them was because of where D'Onofrio would have to go with the character, or maybe that it might be too much pressure. But the rift got so bad that Modine bought a speed bag and D'Onofrio bought a weight set to train for an eventual fistfight between them. And then, it was time to shoot the blanket party scene. As a retaliation for constantly being punished for Pyle's mistakes, the recruits wrap bars of soap in rags and beat Pyle while he is being held down. D'Onofrio would listen to Bob Marley's No Woman No Cry in between takes. The soap in the rags during the shot were pieces of styrofoam, or a rag wrapped in another rag. Modine hated shooting the scene because he actually wanted to fight with D'Onofrio, but in this situation, D'Onofrio couldn't fight back. Modine wrote that he also had a similar experience long ago when playing football, and the coach would punish the whole team for his mistakes. The other players would spit on him. This shot was the most takes that D'Onofrio ever did in the film. They ended up shooting it 11 times. It was also the first time that Kubrick actually told D'Onofrio that he really liked the way a scene turned out. In an essay, Georg Cieslin notes that this is a major turning point for Joker because even though he hesitates, he participates in the brutality, and it stops the audience from thinking that he will be the moral center of the film. This is the breaking point for Pyle. Before this, it could have gone another way, but everyone, including the closest person he has to a friend and ally, has given up on him. What do we do for a living, ladies? Kill, kill, kill! Kubrick brilliantly puts Pyle's transition under the action of the recruits chanting kill in unison which is then followed by a lecture where Gunnery Sergeant Hartman talks about the immense damage that a motivated Marine with a rifle is capable of. Do any of you people know where these individuals learned how to shoot? Private Joker. Sir, in the Marines, sir! When they shot this, it was a really hot day and everyone would put wet towels on their heads in between takes. This is where we see Pyle do the famous Kubrick stare. Kubrick told D'Onofrio that he wanted him to do something that looked very inward. D'Onofrio thought of it as someone who was unaware of their surroundings, with a feeling of being worthless and in a bad place. He described how Kubrick would direct the Kubrick stare. To begin, he would have to get the look right. Kubrick would then say, can you put your head down a little bit and look up more? First I would have to get there, and he would say, put your head down some more. He goes, are you ready? And I'd say yes. He'd go, action, Vincent. He say, would say, action, Vincent, I remember that. And I would do it, and he would linger and linger and linger, and then he'd say, cut, and he goes, okay. Now I'm gonna raise the camera up, we're gonna do the same thing again. So the minute he did that, and he goes, now look up at the camera, I, I knew exactly what he was doing, because he had done it in all the other movies. So he kind of cued me to then, this is where I want you to go, without ever talking about it, this is where I want you to go with the next scenes that fit in this kind of, in the order before he, the bathroom scene. So he kind of cued me into the insanity. So then I thought, okay, so I keep doing what I'm doing, and then whenever he wants to do that shot, he's gonna tell me. So all I gotta do is show up with the interior, and then he's gonna, he's gonna mold it the way he wants. The one time Kubrick really spoke to D'Onofrio about acting was the night before shooting Pyle's death scene. They were walking back to their cars after a day of filming, and in the parking lot, Kubrick asked D'Onofrio if he knew what he was going to do in the scene tomorrow. D'Onofrio said, yeah, I think so. And Kubrick said, good, and started walking away before turning back. Kubrick had this thing where he would always clear his throat before he was about to say something. He goes, <clears throat> are you sure? It has to be really good. D'Onofrio said, I'm hoping, Stanley. At this point, D'Onofrio had been on the production for 13 months and was pretty comfortable, saying in an interview that he no longer felt like he was about to cry when talking to him. Kubrick said, Okay, it has to be big though. It has to be like Lon Chaney big. Lon Chaney had a substantial impact on the early days of cinema and was a pioneer of film acting and makeup effects. Most notably, he played the lead in the 20s adaptations of The Hunchback of Notre Dame and The Phantom of the Opera, where he had a glued strip of fish skin pulling his nostrils up, often causing him to quote, 
bleed like hell. The brilliance of Cheney's performances is in how grotesque and exaggerated he behaved. This thing happened inside me that was like Christmas, or because at home, at my, at my flat, I had about 15 Lon Chaney films on video. Because, because you were obsessed scene. with him at the time? No, because of this scene. Because I always saw Leonard Lawrence turning into a monster. I always saw him as a monster. And I a always, reference for that? I always saw him that, as a weak-minded person that, was, that switched from being a country bumpkin to a monster like his wires got crossed in the training mm -hmm. and they made a monster instead of a soldier. Absolutely. That's how I saw it. And it's a very, when I think back at it, I probably wouldn't have made the, right, that same choice today. But I think it's, it, it came from a very inexperienced, very simple way of looking at it. And I think it was exactly right. Yeah. D'Onofrio also collected Godzilla films and King Kong films while preparing for this scene. He said that the realization that he was thinking the same thing as Kubrick gave him the courage to play the scene how he wanted. He had been working on the look and the voice and wanted to come across as a cornered animal. He also kept in mind the Kubrick stare and worked out his posture in the scene so that the look would happen naturally. To me, it sort of looks like D'Onofrio is playing the scene as if he is wearing a bunch of monster makeup. Like how an actor in full monster prosthetics gets a special kind of courage that is really difficult to get when you are seen. According to D'Onofrio, he performed the scene three times and the kill shot once, saying that it only took an afternoon to shoot both his side and Modine's. Should probably not be, should be more uh, frightened and yeah. then, then get into that. Do something brilliant. It was actually D'Onofrio's last day on the production. And I went, I would go sit next to him and there were two chairs and I would go sit next to him and he'd play it back and we'd watch it. and. He didn't say anything, he just put, put his hand, I think he put his hand on my wrist, Stanley put his hand on my wrist, and he squeezed my wrist, and he said, well, we've got this, we've, this we've got. He was, you could just see that he was thrilled with it. I think that this particular character was so far from me that I lived in it while we were doing it, and I dumped it off quickly after. You know, it was such a sad character. After the production, D'Onofrio and Modine would become friends again, and are still good friends to this day. I'm gonna try something new here. There's an interesting story behind how they did the special effect of Pyle shooting himself, but it would be near impossible to talk about it without showing the effect, which would make YouTube demonetize the whole video. So I decided to make it a separate 4 minute bonus video available on Patreon for $1. This way, I don't have to censor anything and can show you all of the gory details and the photography and other special effects that Kubrick used for inspiration. Supporting me on Patreon at the $1 level now also gets you access to ad-free versions of my videos and helps me in my quest to expand the channel. But first, I want to take a moment to thank this episode's sponsor, Mubi. Mubi is a curated streaming service tailor-made for cinephiles like you. Mubi features a lineup of great films hand-picked by experts, not an algorithm, that take you on a guided journey through the best that cinema has to offer, with a new film added every single day. What's really cool is how Mubi curates their releases into retrospectives, specials, and specific subgenres. It's like having your own personal film festival that you can stream anytime, anywhere. Right now, you can see Nimic, a short film by Yorgos Lanthimos, director of The Killing of a Sacred Deer, The Lobster, and The Favorite. Or check out The Juniper Tree, a retelling of the Brothers Grimm fairy tale starring Bjork. They also have a great collection of hidden gems restored by Drive director Nicholas Winding Refn. And Mubi makes a great gift for the cinephile in your life. You can give the gift of Mubi's incredible ever-evolving lineup and library of films for three months or a year. Try Mubi yourself for 30 days at mubi.com slash cinematyler. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash cinematyler for a whole month of great cinema for free. Or join Cinematyler on Patreon at the $5 level and get extended access to Mubi as a perk. Thanks for watching.